Calder Hall, the world's first commercial nuclear power station. Since 1956, nine large nuclear power stations have been built in Britain based on Calder Hall and using natural uranium as fuel. Further development of the British nuclear power program is based on advanced reactors using more reactive nuclear fuels. Dungeness B, advanced gas-cooled reactor. Dragon, experimental high-temperature reactor. Dunray, fast reactor. Winfrith, steam-generating heavy water reactor. The handling in laboratories and factories of the more reactive nuclear fuels, enriched uranium and plutonium, has increased considerably the number of places where a criticality accident could occur. nuclear reactor derives its power from a chain reaction within the core of nuclear fuel. Within the core, the conditions necessary for criticality have been deliberately and carefully engineered. When a reactor goes critical, atomic energy is released safely and under complete control. Radiation is absorbed by the shielding around the reactor and the heat is carried away by coolants to produce electric power. But on most sites within the United Kingdom Atomic Energy Authority, there are places where fissile materials are handled outside the shielding of a reactor. In these places, criticality might conceivably occur by accident. A chain reaction could be started, this time without control, and with serious, possibly fatal results. Now, we're not talking about an explosion, like that of a nuclear weapon. Such an explosion could never occur by accident. But from the moment of criticality, intense heat and radiation would be emitted. The intense ionizing radiation could be lethal to anyone in the close vicinity of the accident. And subsequent radioactive contamination could affect other parts of the plant. Any place where there is a possibility of such an accident is monitored and full emergency precautions are taken. The prevention of accidents begins much earlier, in the design of new plant to handle fissile materials. With advice from criticality specialists, the engineers and designers are able to reduce to a minimum the number of places where criticality could occur. These designs, with essential controls and checks, provide a framework for the safe operation of the plant. If criticality control is to be effective, however, everyone working with fissile materials must understand what is meant by criticality, how it can and why it must be prevented. For centuries, the atom was regarded as the smallest particle into which matter could be subdivided. The atomic weights of every known element were tabulated. Each atom was thought to be a minute, solid, indestructible sphere. Today, we think of the atom as a miniature solar system, with tiny planetary electrons revolving around a central sun, the nucleus. Even the nucleus is made up of smaller particles. Positively charged protons and neutrons, which have no electric charge. These particles occupy a minute part of the volume swept out by the electrons. The basic particles of the atom are therefore negatively charged electrons, positive protons, and the neutrons. They can all exist independently of the atom and be used as missiles to break more particles of other atoms. The most effective missiles are the neutrons but there's so much space inside an atom that a neutron may miss the nucleus altogether. 
With some types of atom, they just bounce off the nucleus and do no damage. Other elements, such as boron and cadmium, absorb neutrons harmlessly into their nuclei. One element is unique in nature, uranium. This has a rare isotope or chemical twin, uranium-235, which has three less neutrons in its nucleus than uranium-238, the common variety. The 235 isotope has this important property. A bombarding neutron can cause its nucleus to break up violently, releasing energy largely in the form of heat. The heat produced during nuclear fission can be used to generate power. To get a continuous output of power, the process of nuclear fission must obviously be sustained. Let us examine nuclear fission again. The bombarding neutron strikes the nucleus, which begins to split into two. All the particles now redistribute themselves to form two new smaller atoms. These fly apart with tremendous energy, the energy which bound the original nucleus together. Two or three neutrons escape, and these are capable of producing more fissions in other fissile atoms, thereby starting a chain reaction. But if the atoms are widely separated, as in natural uranium, the released neutrons are unlikely to strike them. If they are densely packed, however, as in enriched uranium, all the released neutrons can strike fissile atoms, releasing more neutrons until... <coughs> at a certain concentration, the number of hits balances the misses. This is the moment of criticality. Beyond this critical point, as well as heat, intense and penetrating radiations are generated, depicted here as a blue glow. Uranium arrives at Springfields in the form of concentrate, only one step removed from the crude ore. This cannot possibly go critical because the fissile material is only present in such very small quantities. Large amounts can be handled and the only hazard is its poisonous nature. It's the same throughout the industrial processes which follow, during which the raw material is concentrated and finally converted to metallic uranium. Uranium metal is cast into rods to be used as fuel in the Calder Hall type of reactor. As far as criticality is concerned, there's no danger with natural uranium, since only one atom in 140 is of the fissile 235 isotope. The rest, over 99%, is non-fissile uranium 238. Natural uranium fuel elements can be handled and stored in large quantities without special precautions. On the other hand, more advanced reactors use more reactive fuels. Advanced gas cool reactors, for example, use uranium compounds in which the proportion of fissile uranium-235 has been increased by enrichment. This enrichment is carried out at Capenhurst. The processes for producing enriched uranium in a metallic state must now be conducted on a smaller scale. With enriched uranium, criticality precautions are essential. The greater the degree of enrichment, the smaller the amount that can be handled. This large container is for a compound of non-fissile uranium-238, while this small one is for the same compound but of uranium highly enriched with a fissile isotope. Size is now very important. When fission occurs in a small mass of fissile material, the released neutrons escape easily, being near the surface. With larger masses, the released neutrons from fission find it more difficult to escape, and some may cause further fissions, releasing more neutrons. Finally, they do escape, and the action peters out. At a certain critical mass, each fission gives rise to one further fission. And criticality occurs. The same total mass 
would not, however, be critical if it were cut in half. Each section could be increased, yet remain subcritical, unless recombined. Here is a small piece of enriched uranium metal. It's only safe because it is small, and it's vital that pieces this size should never be brought into close proximity. This principle is well illustrated in this plutonium store where the mass kept in each drawer is strictly limited and the drawers are well spaced. The wire mesh prevents material being introduced between the storage positions. An accurate record of fissile material in use is always kept. Careful accounting prevents the accumulation of a hazardous amount of fissile material by accident. When highly enriched metal is machined, all the turnings have to be weighed and as careful a check kept on them as on the metal itself. Stray neutrons are causing isolated fissions in this metal all the time, but it still cannot go critical because of its small mass. Subcritical masses may be in the form of rods and their combined mass made either critical or safe by adjusting the relative positions of the rods. This method of controlling criticality is used in some designs of fast reactor. Inside the steel sphere of the Dunray fast reactor, the core of highly enriched uranium is no bigger than an oil drum. The core is surrounded by a blanket of natural uranium which acts as a breeding ground for plutonium, a man-made fissile element. Totally enclosed inside a protective steel vessel, the core is controlled by moving groups of the fuel elements up and down. Plutonium itself is also used as a reactor fuel. It's more reactive than uranium-235 so it must be processed in smaller quantities to avoid criticality. But with mechanized procedures, the very small plutonium pellets can still be handled at relatively high rates. But mass control is not the only precaution. Notice how these tall, thin bottles are stacked one above the other. Criticality depends not only on the mass and concentration of fissile material, but also on its shape. Here is a sphere, the worst shape. But the same mass would not be critical if it was squashed into a slab. Now it has a much greater surface area. These slab tanks at Dunray employ this principle for the safe storage of highly fissile solutions. Stray neutrons will cause fission, but the released neutrons are more likely to escape without causing further fissions. With a slab divided into rods, the surface area is increased still further. The released neutrons find it even easier to escape, lessening still further the chances of criticality. Do you remember this vessel containing a highly enriched uranium compound? Its shape is entirely a criticality precaution. The shape of these natural uranium rods, on the other hand, is dictated by heat transfer requirements. These rods, in a variety of protective cans, are the fuel for graphite-moderated reactors of the Calder Hall type. This model shows how fuel elements are packed into channels in a block of graphite. The channels can be seen clearly in this early research reactor called BEPO. The graphite between the rods acts as a moderator. It has the effect of slowing down the escaping neutrons and slow-moving neutrons are much more likely to cause nuclear fission than fast ones. The neutrons released by the fission of one atom move so fast that they've usually passed the nuclei of other atoms before they've had time to cause a second fission. Suppose the neutron is represented by a golf ball and the hole is the nucleus of a fissile atom. A fast neutron is not easily captured. On the other hand, a slow-moving neutron can be captured with comparative ease. In a similar way, slow-moving neutrons are much more likely to enter the nuclei of atoms in their path and cause fission.
the graphite in the reactor slows down the neutron sufficiently for the fuel to become critical, which it would do but for these neutron absorbing control rods. When they are removed, the reactor goes critical. The chain reaction is allowed to continue under control, but it can be stopped instantly by another set of neutron absorbing shutdown rods released from above. But graphite is not the only moderator. Water is a very good moderator and it's much more likely to be present accidentally. Other good moderators are heavy water, polythene and oil. These moderators also reflect neutrons. Because it consists largely of water, so too does the human body. When two masses, subcritical in air, are surrounded by a moderator and reflector such as water, they can go critical. In this store at Winfrith, unlimited quantities of low enriched uranium can be kept in complete safety provided all moderators are rigorously excluded. No water is allowed in here, not even for firefighting. And only a limited quantity of fluid is used in the hydraulic system of the truck. The effect of a moderator such as water is to reduce considerably the minimum critical mass. This model represents the minimum critical mass of solid uranium-235 unmoderated and unreflected. This smaller sphere is the minimum critical mass if the sphere were completely immersed in water. And this very small amount is the minimum critical mass were the uranium to be actually dispersed in water. With plutonium, the masses are even smaller. From left to right, the minimum critical mass of metal in air, in water, and dispersed in water. When fissile materials are transported, they must travel in special packages designed to International Atomic Energy Agency regulations. This ensures that even if the packages were involved in a crash or submerged in water, there would be no danger of criticality. Water is the worst moderator likely to be encountered accidentally. But in a nuclear plant, other moderators may be present. Oil is a good moderator. Fissile material must therefore not be allowed to accumulate in it. In the case of these pumps, a number of safety precautions have been employed. Two small pumps are used, not one large one. Guards are used to keep the oil in the sumps apart. Notice that a distinctive colour is used to prevent confusion with these brown pumps employed in another part of the plant. But that is not all. Suppose someone were to try to connect a yellow pump in a brown area. This is what would happen. It just can't be done. Here, an unsafe situation is prevented by the use of non-mating flanges. Solutions can go critical in unexpected ways. Evaporation of a dilute solution can concentrate the fissile atoms. The effect, of course, is only simulated here. Dilution of a concentrated solution could well mean that a good moderator is being added. A solution may be safe in a cylindrical vessel because of but in a spherical vessel, the result could be critical. Process and research plant, designed to store and carry fissile solutions, often has its own characteristic appearance. Tall cylinders are typical, and pipes, which would normally be grouped together, are now separated. At wind scale, this store for highly fissile plutonium solutions is a good example of careful design. The cylindrical shapes and the spacing of the tanks in which the solutions are stored are both criticality precautions. Also, the floor has been made level and leak tight, so that even if all the liquid leaked out of the pipes, it would still be contained in a safe slab. At Winfrith, a monorail is used to supply fuel elements to a number of research reactors. With different fuel elements in use, complicated interactions would be possible if the fuel elements ever came close together. 
this situation is prevented by using a single track. Automatic trips on the monorail car isolate any section which contains a fuel element. Remember that criticality depends on many factors. The most important are mass, shape, concentration, reflection, and moderators. So that none of these factors be overlooked, before any plant is operated or any process changed, criticality clearance must be obtained. First, the operating management draws up a description of the proposed operation. Then a criticality specialist prepares a nuclear safety argument to demonstrate beyond all reasonable doubt the safety of the operation. Once the argument has been accepted, a criticality clearance certificate is issued and the relevant sections are translated into terms easily understood by the operators. For example, the design of this store for fissile material ensures complete safety while the material remains in the racks. Conditions contained in the criticality clearance certificate govern the removal of fissile material from the racks and thereby ensure that a critical situation cannot be created. A similar procedure is used in the field of research. No experiment involving fissile materials may be conducted until criticality clearance has been obtained. And finally, all operations are subject to independent inspection to assess the overall precautions taken to prevent accidental criticality. But whatever precautions are taken, there still remains the human element. The criticality clearance procedures, the efforts of designers and management are valueless without the cooperation of all those involved. This cooperation is essential if mistakes are to be avoided. Criticality accidents have been reported in other countries. It's your job to see that one never happens here. Understand the problems Obey the rules, and if you have any doubt, seek advice.